I'd only been in the country uh, a couple of weeks. A rookie with the Toronto Argonauts. All the players and coaches <laughs> attended an annual luncheon to support Variety Village. Its purpose, to introduce the new team to its fans. As I hear the bagpipes elicit the attention of the crowd, my heart was warm because, well, my high school band played the bagpipes. Our school song was Scotland the Brave, and every time I heard the bagpipes, it reminded me of the game I loved, the reason why I was in Canada. But today, the bagpipes well, they beckoned the impending presence of our honored guests, the Honorable Lincoln Alexander. Being a man of abbreviated stature, <laughs> I, I couldn't immediately see him because the audience stand stood as they should to receive him, and uh, well, then he emerged. In all of his regalia, he wasn't just a man, he was a black man. <laughs> Tall and as handsome as a human could be. His torso seemed as long as his confidence, and every inch of it seemed to demand more and more respect. <clears throat> and then he spoke. That unforgettable, thunderous voice reverberating between bass and baritone. His diction was defined, his vocabulary vast, and his oratory, oratory was seemingly omnipotent. He didn't just look the part. He was leadership personified, a leader of leaders. Never in my life had I personally witnessed anything or anyone, even growing up in a Southern Baptist church, <laughs> so articulate, so inspiring, so empowering. I wondered just for a minute if this is what it was like what it would have been like to be in the presence of my childhood hero, Martin Luther King. Obviously, he was a man of privilege, or so I thought. Prominent parents who could afford private school, one of the lucky few people of color that were part of the elite. It was the perfect storm where great access and great opportunity came together, effortlessly fused, and even his name screamed, scripted, manufactured leadership. Lincoln Macaulay Alexander. Little did I know that 33,151 days ago today, Lincoln Alexander was born to immigrant parents. His mom a maid, his dad a porter. And that, as a man of color, he, well, he lived in a difficult, if not regrettable time for countless citizens. While Canada certainly can boast a decidedly greater record than its US counterparts, many Canadians Many black Canadians sensed an ocean of hatred, a sea 
of hopelessness, a river of disadvantages. That's a lot of water to swim against. Let's put a comma right there. We'll come back there a little bit later. But his, well, his mom had a plan. You know, she was his hero. And her greatest ally was education. Her mantra became the title of his memoir, Go to School, You're a Little Black Boy. And go to school he did. So much so that four schools in one university hall are named after him. He served his country in World War II as a part of the Royal Canadian Air Force, not settling for good. Well, he graduated from Osgoode Law School. He was the first black MP, the first black cabinet minister, the first black vice regal, vice regal as the, well, lieutenant governor of Ontario. A trailblazer of the highest order that was quick to remind us that he was while he was proud to be black, first, he was Canadian. He rubbed shoulders with the elite and always seemed to be head and shoulders over not just the rest, but the best. He, well, met the queen and dined with African kings. He'd wild presidents and parliament. And he could hold court anywhere, as Keith told me the story. He said, uh, well, Link was headed out on his scooter and he got stuck on a bridge. And in doing so, he was waving for help. <laughs> Everybody recognized Link and they just thought he was holding court on the highway this time. <laughs> And so they just kept passing by. No one stopped until finally someone stopped to help. I guess what I'm going to ask you to do today is not to reduce his life to simply a list of accomplishments. Someone who could smile and wave and make people feel good. I'm reminded of a man who was um, well, he was challenged to face his fears. He had a fear of water and he uh, entered a class, the drown proofing class, and the professor said, there's only a few things you have to do in this class is, well, swim the, swim, swim the length of this Olympic sized swimming pool three times underwater <laughs> in one breath. And then at the end of the third lap, go down to the bottom of the pool, pick up a brick, and bring it to the side. Now, he was flabbergasted. He had no idea how he was doing. But the, the professor went on to explain, there, there's only a few things you have to do to pass this class. And, and, and he says, what you have to do is, see, the first time you begin to swim, as you begin to swim, right, you will find that your eyes will begin to burn. And your eyes will say to you, quit. He said, at that point, just take one more stroke, and the next few will get easier. He says, now the next time you begin, not only have your eyes begun to burn, but your nose have begun to burn, and your nose will say to you, quit. He said, but at that point, take one more stroke, and the next few will get easier. He says, now this is the tough part, because the next time you begin to swim, not, not, not only have your eyes begun to burn and your nose has begun to burn, but now your lungs have begun to burn, and your brain is saying to you, fall, quit. <laughs> he said, but at that point, take one more stroke, and the next few will get easier. Family, I haven't had a chance to spend as much time with you as I would like. Hopefully, we will link together. I want to say to you, though, um, in this challenging time, when you think that you, well, you just don't know what to do, what I'm going to ask you to do is take one more stroke, and the next few would get easier. 
I think of this life. You, can you imagine the mountain of water that he faced? We talked about the ocean of hatred and the sea of uncertainty, the river of disadvantages that this great Canadian faced. And if we simply reduce him to a guy who, well, could charm any woman, we're just not doing him justice. Education was the key. He loved people. Justice was his war cry. Education. In closing, I um, reminded of a story when I was away. My uh, youngest daughter always gets in the bed with my wife and she, um, she jumped in bed. She says, Mommy, Mommy, how do I stop my feet from growing? My wife was like, what? I said, like, yeah, mommy, how do I stop my feet from growing? She's like, Riley, honey, your feet need to keep growing. You need to keep growing. She's like, no, mommy, I got to stop my feet from growing. By now, my wife realizes that she's serious about this, right? So she looks at her. She says, well, what do you mean, honey? Why do you have to stop your feet from growing? She looked at her and she said, because mommy, daddy says he loves me just the way that I am. Lincoln Alexander, after my mom, alongside Martin Luther King, my hero. And it was because he loved everybody he met just the way they are. Family. How deep is the water? Doesn't matter. Keep stroking. That's what Link did.